from the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lays down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. This is the Gospel of the Lord. I mentioned earlier, uh, don't close your hymnals yet. Uh, this morning I'm going to let Martin Luther do this preaching by taking a look at the hymn that we just sang, Dear Christians, One and All Rejoice. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations in our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. As we begin singing Martin Luther's sermon set to music, Martin Luther reminds us that the true objective of praise is to tell others not just who God is, but what God has done. Ask most people what God is, and you'll usually get a list of attributes. God is holy, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, eternal, and so on. Now these are very accurate and truthful attributes of God, but there are many false religions that claim the same exact attributes for their God. Talk to any Muslim. And they will tell you that Allah is holy, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, eternal, and so on. While these attributes are certainly true attributes of God, they don't really set God aside from the claims of many false gods. The way to distinguish the true God from all the false gods is, as stanza one says, to proclaim the wonders he has done. The victory that his right hand has won is the precious ransom that he pays for us. Here, Martin Luther begins to preach the difference between the true God and the false gods. The true God pays a precious ransom for us. False religions ask us to pay a precious ransom for ourselves. So Martin Luther is basically saying, Okay, church, let's proclaim to each other and to the world the true God and show his love to us by sacrificing himself in order to ransom us. The Augsburg Confession tells us that true repentance is nothing else than to have contrition and sorrow or terror about sin, and yet at the same time to believe in the gospel an absolution that sin is forgiven and grace is obtained through Christ. Stanzas 2 and 3 of this hymn proclaim the terror of sin. <clears throat> Fast bound in Satan's chains I lay, death brooded darkly over me. Sin was my torment night and day. In sin my mother bore me. Notice how Luther even brings in the teaching of original sin, straight from Psalm 51, verse 5, which says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. In sin did my mother conceive me. These words teach us that we not only commit sins, but we actually are sin, even in our mother's womb. As we grow in knowledge, the understanding of our sin also grows. Not only do we sin more and more, but our understanding of that sin increases. Do we hope in our own works? 
the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul writes, By works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. At another time he wrote, By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So it's that Luther begins stanza three by reminding us that we can't work our way out of our sinful condition. He says, My own good works all came to naught, no grace or merit gaining, free will against God's judgment fought, dead to all good remaining. Luther even reminds us of Paul's words to the Ephesians, that you were dead in the trespasses and sins. Well, by the time we come to the end of stanza of three, Luther has preached two stanzas of 200 proof terror about sin, and so has fulfilled Christ's instruction to proclaim repentance. If we rightly understand our sin, we should be terrified, but don't despair. Instead, stanza four, Luther brings the preaching of forgiveness of sins in the name of Christ. The English translation begins stanza four with two of the most beautiful words in the English language. But God. Time after time, the history of the Bible shows us that the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Nevertheless, after humans really mess up the situation, God comes to the rescue. The first words of stanza four are amazing. But God had seen my wretched state before the world's foundation, and mindful of his mercies great, he planned for my salvation. With these words, Luther is telling us that God already planned your salvation, even before he said, let there be light on the first day of creation. How can Luther say that? Well, listen to the words from the Apostle Paul's greeting in his letter to the Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. This teaching blew me away the first time I understood it. When God began the work of creation, he had already planned out my salvation, me personally. In his perfect knowledge, he knew that I, a damned sinner, would be born on January 15, 1974. And he already had a plan of salvation, specifically designed for me. And the same is true for each and every one of you. God had a plan of salvation in place for you, personally, individually, before he even said, let there be light. So what is this plan? Well, Luther continues. He turned to me a father's heart. He did not choose the easy part, but gave his dearest treasure. Here we see that God turns to us with the heart of a father, full of love, ready to make the hard sacrifice for his family. Stanza 5 is simply an expansion of John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Luther records, God said to his beloved Son, It's time to have compassion. Then go, bright jewel of my crown, and bring to all salvation. From sin and sorrow set them free. Slay bitter death for them that they may live with you forever. These words teach that God the Father actually sent God the Son in his love for us. Now when you look at stanza six, stanza six is Christmas. It's all about the Son of God becoming fully human in order to save us. The Son obeyed his Father's will, was born a virgin mother, and God's good pleasure to fulfill, he came to be my brother. His royal power disguised he bore 
a servant's form like mine he wore to lead the devil captive. It's just as the Apostle Paul told the Galatians, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Now in stanza seven, Jesus proclaims his gospel to me personally. And as you sing or meditate on these words, he proclaims this to you. Luther writes, To me, he said, stay close to me. I am your rock and castle. The rock and castle language comes right out of Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Then Luther writes, Your ransom I myself will be, for you I strive and wrestle. Luther proclaims that Christ will be our ransom. As the Apostle Peter writes, Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. And then Luther writes, For I am yours and you are mine, and where I am you may remain. Here is Luther unpacking the words of Jesus in the upper room. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Then Luther writes, the foe shall not divide us. This phrase agrees with the words that the Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul to write. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Stanza 8 begins with Good Friday. Though he will shed my precious blood, of life me thus bereaving, all this I suffer for your good. Be steadfast and believing. Life will from death the victory win. My innocence shall bear your sin, and you are blessed forever. This is simply the message of the entire Bible. There's the words of judgment on the serpent in Eden. The suffering servant passages of Isaiah. The actual passion accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Even the last book of the Bible teaches that we will sing of the Lamb who was slain. So far, Luther has preached our sin and our desperate need for a Savior. He has preached the role of the Father in sending His beloved Son to save us. He has preached the role of the Son in assuming humanity in order to save humanity by shedding His blood to earn salvation for us. And now it's time for stanza 9 to preach the Holy Spirit's work of delivering our salvation to us. He writes, Now to my Father I depart, from earth to heaven ascending, and heavenly wisdom to impart, the Holy Spirit sending. In trouble He will comfort you, and teach you always to be true, and into truth shall guide you. These words are a paraphrase of the very words of Jesus in the upper room. Some of those words we heard during our gospel reading this day. But now I am going to him who sent me. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority. Whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we receive comfort, the absolute assurance of salvation, 
and strength to share the proclamation of repentance and the forgiveness of sin by the means of the truth of God's word. Finally, in stanza 10, Luther reviews the life of the church. Well, what instructions has Jesus left for his people? What I on earth have done and taught, guide all your life and teaching. So shall the kingdom's work be wrought and honored in your preaching. These words remind me of the Great Commission at the end of Matthew. We are to preach God's word in its truth and purity and administer the sacraments according to Christ's instructions. And in a way, we've come all the way back to stanza one. The church is here to proclaim the wonders God has done. We're here to continue proclaiming repentance and the forgiveness of sins. Luther ends this final stanza with a warning from Jesus. But watch lest foes with base alloy the heavenly treasure should destroy. This final word I leave you. These words are consistent with the warnings of Jesus. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And see that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. And they will lead many astray. We have barely touched the surface of what this hymn teaches. Each stanza could be the basis for a full sermon. Nevertheless, this hymn fulfills the words that the Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul to write to the church in Corinth. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts. These words teach us that hymns are one way to teach and admonish one another so that the word of Christ dwells in us richly. Amen. And may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.